In most years, the Kentucky Derby is pulled off seamlessly, without so much as a hint of controversy. After all, Churchill Downs has had more than a century of practice in hosting the country's most prestigious horse race. But as with any major sporting event, occasionally things happen in the run for the roses that are not part of the script. One famous example was the 1933 Kentucky Derby, held during the Great Depression and also the time of Prohibition, for which then-Governor Ruby Lafoon was apologetic. Ned juleps are not what they used to be in Kentucky, but thank God we have beautiful women and Kentucky thoroughbreds still left. Here are the thoroughbreds, the girls are watching them, and... But the 33 Derby would be remembered for more than bourbonless juleps. The race would become known as the fighting finish. Jockey Herb Fisher aboard head play, and Don Meade riding broker's tip, engaged in a tug of war during the final 16th of a mile. At one point, Fisher confessed striking Mead in the head with his whip. Into the home stretch. Head play is on top, but broke a tip with Don Mead up, has made his move, and is third on the rail. Charlie O is second. A jamming, slamming drive for the finish. Broke a tip who has held it almost nine to one is coming through on the inside. Jockeys Mead and Fisher are giving and taking plenty of punishment, but the judges don't notice as the boys grab and slash at each other. It's the closest finish in years and the roughest. Broke a tip wins. Broker's tip was declared the winner by placing judges. This was before the advent of the photo finish camera, and he also survived a claim of foul by Fisher. Even using slow motion replays of the newsreel footage, the fighting finish is difficult to pick up. Meade was attempting to get Broker's tip through along the rail, inside of head play. Fisher moved head play over in an attempt to intimidate Broker's tip. As Broker's Tip was forced dangerously close to the rail, and knowing Fisher's reputation as a tough rider, Meade instinctively reached out to push head play away and grab the saddle towel. Fisher admitted losing his cool and fought to remove Meade's grip. This historic photograph provides a better look at the battle between Fisher and Meade. The win by Broker's Tip was allowed to stand. Later, Fisher claimed that the stewards were reluctant to disqualify Broker's Tip because the colt was owned by Colonel E.R. Bradley, a prominent Kentuckian. Few disputed that allegation. Meade and Fisher didn't speak for 15 years, but later became close friends. The horses in the 1933 Derby were nothing special. In fact, the Derby was the only career victory by Broker's Tip, who was injured in the Preakness. But the fighting finish ensures a special place in Derby infamy. A decade later, the Kentucky Derby twice barely missed becoming a casualty of World War II. As the war raged, the Office of Defense Transportation requested that citizens refrain from all unnecessary travel to keep railways and roads clear for military uses. And then, for racing fans, came the punchline. The Office of Defense then asked that the 1943 Kentucky Derby be called off. Colonel Matt Wynn, a longtime Churchill Downs president, began lobbying on the Derby's behalf. Wynn had pledged to run the Derby, even if there are only two horses in the race and only a half dozen people in the stands. He ultimately reached a compromise with the government. The Derby could be run, but out-of-town box holders were sent letters requesting they not attend. And the 43 running was dubbed the Streetcar Derby because the attendance was comprised exclusively of residents from the Louisville area. America's annual Blue Ribbon Horse Race goes on regardless. And for 60,000 spectators who got here by streetcar, no doubt, the getaway of the year's back three-year-olds is the big news of the moment. The track officials were stunned at the attendance, over 65,000. Colonel Wynn, who witnessed the first 75 runnings of the Derby, claimed 1943 was the most unforgettable of them all. Count Fleet, ironically owned by the Hertz family of rent-a-car fame, won the streetcar derby and would go on to become the sixth horse to sweep the Triple Crown. Two years later, the U.S. government banned all horse racing and the Kentucky Derby again appeared doomed. But the ban lasted only four months, and for the only time in its long history, the Derby was run in June, 
on June 9, 1945. only one horse to root for. As they come round that final turn, Hoop Jr. is delivering the goods. Buy me a bond fading as pot of luck. Darby Diep and Air Sailor begin their home stretch bid. Art Caro now turns on the steam for his third derby victory, opening up a six-length lead, and Hoop Jr. ramps home all by himself. In 1957, a dream came true. But the result was a nightmare for jockey Bill Shoemaker. During the week of that year's Kentucky Derby, owner Ralph Lowe had a dream that his colt, Gallant Man, lost the race because of a jockey error. Specifically, Lowe dreamed that Gallant Man's jockey stood up prematurely in the irons, misjudging the finish line at Churchill Downs. Lowe mentioned the dream to Gallant Man's jockey in the Derby, the legendary shoemaker, as a warning. The shoe laughed it off. But after the race, he wasn't laughing. Willie Shoemaker on Gallant Man has victory in his grasp. Slowly he pulls the breast, then ahead of Iron Leech. Just another 16th to go. Then it happens. Shoemaker misjudges the finish line, stands up in the stirrups, and Iron Leech wins by a nose. Closest derby finish in 24 years. Calumet Farm's Iron Leech reached the wire just a nose in front of Gallant Man in the competitive 57 derby. But few fans or media members noticed that Lowe's dream had indeed come true. When Gallant Man reached the 16th pole, Shoemaker stood up, believing the race was over. When we hit the 16th pole, where the finish line is on most racetracks in the country, I kind of raised up for a second. I thought that was the finish line, but it was another 16th to further towards the turn where the finish line was. And, uh, well, that's how I misjudged it, but, uh, and I got beat a nose. Shoemaker stood up in the irons for only a second, but with Iron Leisure's margin of victory just a bare nostril, did Shoe's mistake cost Gallant Man the Derby trophy? I think I would have won that race, yeah, but I could have kept riding him hard, yeah. A dejected Shoemaker quickly dressed and left the track with few comments about the race. It was to be owner Ralph Lowe's only chance to win the Derby, but he took the disappointment with class. About a week later, I got a telegram from the steward saying that they were compelled to suspend me 15 days for making that mistake. Ralph Lowe got mad at the stewards, and he said, well, I'm not going to run my horse in the Preakness. I'll run him in the Belmont, and that's what he did. He sent me a new automobile, a big, beautiful Chrysler, to uh, kind of make me feel a little better because I really felt bad about the mistake I made. And he waited to, for the Belmont, and the gallant man... Uh, Won the Belmont very easily. In fact, he said what was then the track record. Because of its unusually long stretch, Churchill Downs can be confusing for jockeys who don't ride it regularly. Over the years, several other mistakes have occurred in the Derby, although none as high profile as shoemakers. For example, in the 1981 Kentucky Derby, another Hall of Fame jockey, Sandy Hawley, also mistook the 16th pole for the finish. Hawley was riding Partez, trainer D. Wayne Lucas's first Derby starter, who finished third behind Pleasant Colony and Woodchopper. The 1960s were tumultuous years in the United States, and the decade was an eventful one for the Kentucky Derby, too. In 1965, a fire broke out in the Churchill Downs clubhouse area. On the biggest day in American racing, the fire could have been a catastrophe. But the Louisville Fire Department quickly contained the blaze, and some patrons in the area were even reluctant to leave their valuable seats for fear they wouldn't get to see the race. Because of the fire, post time for the 65 Derby was delayed a half hour. It's just a montage of visions of fire trucks coming down the, coming down the stretch and fire hoses just spread all the way down from the finish line toward the first turn. I don't think that our television truck took it that seriously in the beginning. It was like they were going to put out a little brush fire or something. And then when we saw the flame licking away at the top of the corner of the roof, thank goodness the wind was blowing toward the first turn from the finish line. So the flames were actually licking out over the parking lot. If the wind had been blowing the other way, we could have had a terrible, terrible tragedy. There were no injuries, and the show went on, with Willie Shoemaker winning 1965's delayed derby aboard Lucky Debonair. 
Churchill Downs was again fortunate in 1967 when civil rights protests threatened to disrupt the Kentucky Derby. Ted Bassett, who in future years would become chairman of Keeneland Racetrack and the Breeders' Cup, was at the time a key figure in the controversy as the director of the Kentucky State Police. Governor Breathitt, who was uh, governor of Kentucky at that time, called me and said there had been a threat by the by the protesters and the leader of the movement, which was Martin Luther King's brother. We caught a call shortly about 2 a.m. from the Detroit Police Department indicating that uh, one of the ways that they were going to disrupt the Derby was that they were going to have a series of protesters around the starting gate and using uh, dog training whistles, which has that very high piercing audible sound that is not uh, detectable by the human ear. We went to a number of uh, prominent veterinarians uh, at about 6 o'clock in the morning to determine if they could advise us. Does a dog training whistle have a, a detrimental effect on a horse? And we could get no clear-cut explanation. At 10 a.m., the morning of the race, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke at a Louisville church, the Church of Our Merciful Savior at 11th and Walnut, and announced the cancellation of the Derby protest. But word of Dr. King's speech never reached Governor Breathitt or Bassett, and strict security measures were taken. We put at the starting gate approximately 50 um, National Guard Guardsmen and about 20 state troopers around there and pushed the crowd back approximately 75 or 100 yards along the entire stretch of the Kentucky Derby beyond the finish line at the turn back to the uh, starting gate. Had 200 state troopers there and 2,500 National Guardsmen. All in all, it was um, a day without any major incidents or something that um, would in any way deter from the running of the Derby. And we all felt a great sigh of relief when it was over. And so the 1967 Kentucky Derby, won by long shot Proud Clarion, was run without incident. Dating back to the first running in 1875, no Kentucky Derby winner has been disqualified for interference during a race. But one Derby winner was disqualified for other reasons. In 1968, the two Derby favorites were Calumet Farms' Forward Pass, the Bluegrass and Florida Derby winner, and Dancer's Image, owned by brash Bostonian Peter Fuller. Prior to that year's derby, Dancer's Image prepped in the Governor's Cup Stakes at Maryland's Bowie Race Course. That race was run on April 6th, two days after the assassination of Martin Luther King. Fuller had met King earlier and pledged that if Dancer's Image won the race, the entire winner's share would be donated to his cause. I felt strongly, it wasn't so much the movement, as I felt strongly that, uh, gee, you know, uh, Met a lot of guys uh, in boxing, uh, liked them, uh, black guys, white guys, different kinds of guys, and uh, basically this was wrong. This was a terrible thing. They shut off a voice that was very important. Dancer's Image indeed won the Governor's Cup, and Fuller presented $62,500 to Coretta Scott King, Dr. King's widow. After word of the donation got out, Fuller and his family received threats. Some of the people were very thrilled, and then I got letters from people that weren't thrilled and uh, were basically uh, racist and said things to me uh, that I couldn't repeat. Fuller was concerned for his safety at the Kentucky Derby, but once the race began, those thoughts took a back seat. It's Kentucky Sherry on the inside, and now here's Dancer's Image has gone to the rail, and he's coming like a house of fire. Forward pass outside of those two. Dancer's Image is there, and he's battling for the lead right now, and we've got uh, 200 yards to go. Dancer's Image is the leader, and forward pass is coming up into second place. Francis Hatt charges into third, and it is just yards to go. Dancer's Image is trying to hang on, and charging is Francis Hatt, but it is Dancer's Image that wins it by two. The Maryland Red Dancer's Image scored a clear Kentucky Derby victory over forward pass. And at 7-2 betting odds, the outcome was hardly shocking. But three days later, Churchill Down stewards announced that post-race urine tests revealed the presence of phenobutazone, or bute, an analgesic that at the time was prohibited for race day use in Kentucky. Suddenly, uh, you're under suspicion. And uh, we, we had a, a New York Post put on the plane 
And Joan and I were sitting in back of these guys, the two businessmen. They looked at posts. They had, you know, couldn't have been bigger headlines if it was World War. Derby winner doped. And they turned to each other, and one said to the other, they'll do anything to win a derby. Dancer's image was disqualified, and forward pass declared the official winner. Fuller fought the disqualification in the courts for four years. An appeals court judge overturned the ruling, but the disqualification was ultimately reinstated by the state Supreme Court. Decades later, Fuller still believes the disqualification was politically motivated. The result of his controversial donation to the King family and the fact that Forward Pass belonged to the Markey family's bastion of Kentucky breeding, Calumet Farm. To be perfectly honest with you, I still think that when it got to the state Supreme Court, and you only have to fly into Lexington to find out about Calumet at that time, Lucille Markey, great gal, gives a lot of money to nice charities and so on in her time, but baby, big time stuff, you know. And, and I understand that the message went out, I can't prove it, but the message went out, hey, either take that horse down or I don't run in Kentucky. Now that's a big message, if in fact it happened. Fuller makes no bones about his feeling that Dancer's Image was the real winner of that 1968 Kentucky Derby. And he isn't shy about bucking the sports traditionalists. As a testimony to his feelings, this billboard stands on his New Hampshire farm. Matter of fact, uh, I thought that uh, the comment of one jockey club guy uh, was interesting. He said, uh, disgusting. And I said, gee, I think you're right. Your statement, of course, is what's disgusting, not mine. Legendary performers such as Secretariat, Seattle Slough, and the inseparable affirmed an Aladar. And the 70s would also produce a well-known race caller, the late Charles Chick Anderson. Americans who watched the Triple Crown races on television became familiar with Chick's vivid descriptions of their equine heroes. Nearly three decades later, they stand the test of time. Driving along the rail and Dyke is driving on the outside. Coming to the wire, Majestic Prince. They're coming on to the finish, and this is still very close. Majestic Prince is holding on by a head, and he wins it by a head. Then on the rail, moving up is Bull Reason. Cannon Nero, the second, takes over the lead as they come to the wire. They're going to hit the finish, and it's the South American horse. Cannon Nero, the second, who is the surprise winner. Three lengths. Now and then the stretch. It's Secretariat. Secretariat on the outside to take the lead. Sham holding in second. It's Secretariat moving away. He has it by two and a half. Sham, then on the outside, our native. At the wire, it's going to be Secretariat. He wins it by two lengths. There's a strong left-handed whip again by Pinkai. He goes to it time and time again. But Ronnie Turcott has his whip put away. And Secretariat has him put away. He's been getting the raw away. It is Secretariat. He's coming to the wire. He wins it by two and a half, almost three. Jam an easy second. Anderson's most famous call can still raise goosebumps, even on the most jaded of racetracks. They're on the turn. It's Secretariat is blazing along the first three quarters of a mile in 109 and four fifths. Secretariat is widening now. He is moving like a tremendous machine. Secretariat by 12. Secretariat by 14 length on the turn. Sham is dropping back. It looks like they'll catch him today as Mike Allen and Vice of Prince are both coming up to him now. But Secretariat is all alone. He's out there almost a sixteenth of a mile away from the rest of the horses. Secretariat is in a position that seems impossible to catch. He's into the stretch. Secretariat leads his field by 18 lengths. And now Price of Prince has taken second, and Mike Ballard has moved back to third. They're in the stretch. Secretariat has opened a 22-length lead. He is going to be the Triple Crown winner. Here comes Secretariat to the wire. An unbelievable, an amazing performance. He hits the finish 25 lengths in front. Chick Anderson was a great race caller, but he wasn't perfect. Two years after his stirring accounts of Secretariat's Triple Crown sweep, Anderson was faced with a dilemma in the 1975 Kentucky Derby. The field included only 15 horses, down from 23 the year before. But circumstances made it an even tougher announcing assignment. 
1975 at the Kentucky Derby, I was serving as the backup announcer at Churchill Downs, a young, impressionable fellow. And really taking it all in, I happen to be fortunate enough to be set, sitting actually in the booth with Chick Anderson. The booth at Churchill Downs has two levels. I was in the upper level. Chick was in the lower level. The infield action uh, had the crowd getting very excited. And as a matter of fact, they broke down the restraining inside fence and all moved to the outside fence. And the view for the announcer suddenly was blocked where the jockey silks are concerned. Announcer really had to study the caps on that occasion. There was no way to know that when the horses were going in the starting gate. So it was quite a surprise, I'm sure, for Chick Anderson. From his view, low in the press box, he was only seeing the jocks' caps and not the silks. On the turn, it's Avatar and Diablo. They hooked up again. Diablo on the outside, ahead in front. Avatar on the rail has the four lengths. Then further back, Sylvan Place has moved to third. Master Derby is now fourth. On the rail, Foolish Place is sixth as they come forward ahead of the stretch. But as the field for the 75 Derby turned for home, Anderson mistakenly began referring to Foolish Pleasure as Prince Thou Art, the race's second favorite. On the inside, Avatar, Diablo, Prince Thou Art is coming with the drive to Master Derby. Nearing the finish, close quarters, Avatar, Prince Thou Art. Prince Thou Art on the outside has the lead ahead. It's Prince Thou Art holding the lead this on the inside, Avatar. Foolish Pleasure, Foolish Pleasure to the lead, Avatar. Then it's Diablo in third, further back, Master Derby is fourth. Suddenly he realized he had the wrong horse. Happens to announcers a lot but it's never supposed to happen to you in the Kentucky Derby. He sat there in the booth and just kind of held his head in his hands and realized that he had made a mistake on the one race that he pointed to for the entire year. So for Chick, who was a real pro and one of the great announcers ever, and that was about the lowest moment of his career. Chick Anderson took his mistake hard, but as is often the case, his Derby dilemma was but a brief footnote to an otherwise illustrious career. To be sure, the Derby has had its dilemmas, but even these have only added to the color, the history, and the tradition of America's greatest race, the Kentucky Derby. In most years, the Kentucky Derby is pulled off seamlessly, without so much as a hint of controversy. After all, Churchill Downs has had more than a century of practice in hosting the country's most prestigious horse race. But as with any major sporting event, occasionally things happen in the run for the roses that are not part of the script. One famous example was the 1933 Kentucky Derby, held during the Great Depression and also the time of Prohibition, for which then Governor Ruby LaFoon was apologetic. Mint juleps are not what they used to be in Kentucky. But thank God we have beautiful women and Kentucky thoroughbreds still left. There's plenty of punishment, but the judges don't notice as the boys grab and slash at each other. It's the closest finishing years and the roughest. Broker's Tip wins! Broker's Tip was declared the winner by placing judges. This was before the advent of the photo finish camera, and he also survived a claim of foul by Fisher. Even using slow motion replays of the newsreel footage, the fighting finish is difficult to pick up. Meade was attempting to get Broker's tip through along the rail, inside of head play. Fisher moved head play over in an attempt to intimidate Broker's tip. As Broker's tip was forced dangerously close to the rail, and knowing Fisher's reputation as a tough rider, Meade instinctively read the info. A decade later, the Kentucky Derby twice barely missed becoming a casualty of World War II. As the war raged, the Office of Defense Transportation requested that citizens refrain from all unnecessary travel to keep railways and roads clear for military uses. And then, for racing fans, came the punchline. The Office of Defense then asked that the 1943 Kentucky Derby be called off. Colonel Matt Wynn, a longtime Churchill Downs president, began lobbying on the Derby's behalf. Wynn had pledged to run the Derby, even if there are... Here are the thoroughbreds. The girls are watching them, and... But the 
33 Derby would be remembered for more than bourbonless jewels. The race would become known as the fighting finish. Jockey Herb Fisher aboard head play and Don Meade riding broker's tip engaged in a tug of war during the final 16th of a mile. At one point, Fisher confessed striking Meade in the head with his whip. Into the home stretch. Head play is on top, but broker's tip with Don Meade up has made his move and is third on the rail. Charlie O is second. A jamming, slamming drive for the finish. Broker's tip who has held it almost nine to one is coming through on the inside. Jackie's Meade and Fisher are giving and taking. Reached out to push head play away and grab the saddle towel. Fisher admitted losing his cool and fought to remove Meade's grip. This historic photograph provides a better look at the battle between Fisher and Meade. The win by Broker's Tip was allowed to stand. Later, Fisher claimed that the stewards were reluctant to disqualify Broker's Tip because the colt was owned by Colonel E.R. Bradley, a prominent Kentuckian. Few disputed that allegation. Meade and Fisher didn't speak for 15 years, but later became close friends. The horses in the 1933 Derby were nothing special. In fact, the Derby was the only career victory by Broker's Tip, who was injured in the Preakness. But the fighting finish ensures a special place in Derby.